Well, I'm Adam Ozan. I'm an economist at Manchester University, and this is my course, Econ 10061 Introductory Mathematics. It's a first year course taken by between 200 and 250 students each year. The course is designed for students who stopped doing maths at the age of 16, and in the UK that means that they took their GCSE exams in maths, but then chose not to pursue maths further at AS level or A level. So these are young people who are really quite fearful of maths and have not done maths for at least two years, in some cases three or four years. And what we attempt to do is to introduce the students to the main mathematical tools used in economics, finance and business. The students attend lectures, 18 hours of lectures and 10 weekly one-hour tutorials in smaller groups of about 25 people or so. Here we have the blackboard space for the course. And what you will see here, first of all, is that there's a very large amount of material that we have. Here gives them instructions for what they need to do throughout the semester, in the first weeks, but then throughout the semester in order to do well on the course. In the second section, basically is what I talk about in the very first introductory lecture, provides them with a course outline giving details of assessment for the course based partly on examination and partly on coursework. The third and fourth sections give them information about the staff teaching on the course myself and to teaching assistants. We have traditional lecture notes, tutorial exercises and the answers to the exercises. I must say I find adaptive release extremely useful. I'm able to schedule and I know in advance which assignments I will set each week. In addition to those traditional teaching methods, we also make use of lecture podcasts, videos of my lectures, so that if the students miss a lecture, God forbid, they can come back and see what they've missed. In addition, we have Blackboard quizzes and we have a scheme called PASS. Uh, in America, I think this is called Supplementary Instruction. PASS stands for Peer Assisted Study Sessions. These are additional group meetings every week where groups of 12 to 15 first year students meet together with two second or third year students who have taken the course previously and go through the work together. We organize the past groups last year, there were 12 past groups using Blackboard groups. So this is extremely helpful. In addition, we have a couple of classroom clicker sessions. I use these for revision. And then finally, the students can obtain, while they're preparing for their exam, copies of past exam papers and sketch answers to those exam papers, together with web links to publish it as textbooks, websites, where there's a lot more tutorial and teaching material available to them there. The Blackboard space acts as a hub. All the activities, all of these various activities I've just described, are organized through Blackboard. And there is a huge amount of information, therefore, that we need to kind of pass on to students and enable their interaction with the course. I have devoted a lot of time to trying to create a Blackboard space which is accessible, which is easy to navigate. I think one of the things I've realized using Blackboard is that academics, the people who do the teaching at universities, are not web designers. When I look at colleagues' Blackboard spaces, I can't find anything and I wonder how the students can find anything. And partly for that reason, and I, I've spent so much time on Blackboard trying to ensure that not only is all the information here, but readily accessible and it's intuitive and it's easy to find one's way around it. One of the innovations is the way I use a tablet, laptop and Microsoft OneNote to deliver lectures. The students can download lecture notes each week from Blackboard. So ideally what I hope they all do is they will download and make hard copies and put hard copies into a file. These then are the lecture notes which I use in the lecture. But what you'll notice here is that there are gaps and this is deliberate. The students come to the lectures and they've got only partially completed lecture notes. 
as we see here, there are examples here which are incomplete. Now what I do then during the lectures is to complete these lecture notes. I complete them on a tablet and using Microsoft OneNote and a stylus pen and the students can then copy what I write into their lecture notes. And here you see uh, an example of one of my completed lectures. I'm afraid I'm not a great artist, so you can see that there's some problems with my drawings, but I tend to think the students can follow this. Using a tablet in this way helps in three ways. It helps with attendance, attention, and concentration. First of all, with attendance, there's an incentive for students to come to the lectures because the notes are incomplete, and so that they know that there will be some value added involved in coming to the lectures. Secondly, it helps with their attention. They can actually really pay attention to what I am saying instead of having to devote the whole time of the lecture to copying down everything I say. With the old-fashioned chalk and an old-fashioned blackboard, they spend all the time trying to get down every word without really trying to listen and understand what you were saying. At the same time, the fact that every now and again they have to put pen to paper, that improves their concentration. It's quite difficult to spend 50 minutes or an hour paying attention constantly and concentrating all the time. But at that point, I say something, I write on the page, they have to concentrate once again and put their pen to paper. So this really helps with attendance, attention and concentration. I see really using this technique as combining the advantages of PowerPoint and chalk and talk. You have the pre-prepared slides of PowerPoint, so you can get through material quite quickly. Students can print out copies in advance because it's all saved digitally. They can get digital copies afterwards, as you can with PowerPoint. But at the same time, it has all the advantages of chalk and talk. It has that flexibility and that spontaneity that PowerPoint lacks. During the lecture, I can think of an additional example that I want to work through, and I've got the space to do that here. You can't do that with PowerPoint. Inevitably, I will sometimes make mistakes. I can usually tell when I made a mistake. The students start mumbling. What did he say? Eight times seven isn't 63, is it? Or something of that kind. And as that mumbling rises, I realize something's gone wrong and I can ask them or they will interrupt and tell me. And in that way, you get a real sense of the students and the lecturer interacting throughout the lecture. It also means that as I'm working through something like this, I am working at the same pace as the students. What tends to happen with PowerPoint is that as you look at your watch and think, I've only got five minutes left and I've got a lot to get through, very tempting to start clicking on those slides, click slide from slide to slide, so fast that students cannot keep up with you. Using this technique, it means that I slow down. I'm writing in the same way that the students are, and that helps with the pacing of the lectures. So I think of this technique as being theatre, whereas PowerPoint is cinema. You go to the cinema, everything's delivered in front of you. You go to the theatre, the audience and the actors on the stage interact with each other. And my lectures are podcasted. So here is an example of one of those podcasts to give you an idea of how this works during the lectures. Equals x to the n dy by dx will equal n x. And n. in this extract, having introduced them to the concept of differentiation and having explained the first rule of differentiation, the power rule, here we're looking at some examples applying that rule. Y e this means that dy by dx will equal 5x. So this works very successfully indeed, and the students give me really wonderful feedback on it. One of the problems that we have with Econ 1061 is that we have a large number of students, between 200 and 250 students, and rather few members of staff. Myself, the lecturer, and two tutors. And we have had a problem with providing students with feedback. Each week, the students hand in an assignment, and that means that over 10 weeks or so, they hand in over a thousand pieces of work. And that is rather too much work for the two tutors to mark each week. So they can attend lectures, and they can attend tutorials, and having handed in the 
weekly assignments they can go to a tutorial and ask their tutors questions in the tutorials but their work as such is not marked now to overcome this I've introduced this feature again delivered through Blackboard a couple of years ago each week I collected in a sample of the students work and marked it myself using my tablet I have anonymized that work and made it available to the students through Blackboard. Here we have a list of the feedback on tests and on the weekly assignments that have been set. And so they can access these PDF copies of the 10 pieces of student work that I marked. And this is not their own work, but what they can see here is other people's work that I've corrected. And what they can find here is what I'm looking for when I'm marking because I not only corrected the work but I've also awarded marks for it. Here's obviously not a very good example this is somebody who I deem to have failed this particular assignment and there are comments on here and the student has not answered the question they've used the wrong notation they've made errors here and I'm correcting it and highlighting what the solution should have been and then at the end of the work again a comment and a mark. In the UK system here I've awarded an upper second, a 2-1. And then some advice, they need to tidy up their presentation and make fewer errors. Although this is not a student's own individual piece of work, they find this very useful because when students come to university, uh, they've been through school, they know what they need to do in order to obtain a good grade at A level or AS level. They know what the difference is between a grade A or a grade B. They come to university, and in the first semester of university, they're not really clear as yet as to what the standards are. What is required to get a first, an upper second, a lower second, a third, and so on. And through doing this, they can compare what they're doing with what other people are doing, and see, hmm, well clearly, I can see why Adams awarded these other students two ones and first, because their work is so much more accurate and much clearer than my own. That's what I need to do to improve. So, through this technique, the students learn both the standards required and they understand what I'm looking for when I award marks for good, clear, accurate examples. So what we see here of going back to Blackboard is that I've been able to build up over here a bank based on work I've done in past years and which future students will benefit from. And it's all very time saving. I don't have to repeat this every year. And it's all delivered through Blackboard. So what I hope we've shown you with this short video is an overview of the course and the way in which a huge amount of material and a varied set of activities, pass groups, classroom clicker sessions and the like are delivered to a large class with limited resources very effectively and very efficiently and all of this is enabled through Blackboard. Without Blackboard we wouldn't be able to organize this in such a neat, well-focused, well-structured way. Thank you very much.